Evolutionists deny the fact of the global flood, but their theory was destroyed with the discovery of marine fossils and oceanic sandstone on the tops of mountains around the world, including the highest peak on Earth, Mount Everest. This is proof that ocean waters once covered these mountains. To explain this shocking discovery, they just made up the idea that the entire country of India slammed into the southern edge of Asia tens of millions of years ago, causing constant uplift, resulting in the Himalayan mountain chain. They made up this convoluted just-so story to explain these unexpected circumstances with no evidence whatsoever. Meanwhile, creationists weren't even surprised by this at all. Obviously, the only real explanation is that the sediments on these mountains were deposited by a worldwide flood. So why are all these supposed scientists engaging in all of this mental gymnastics to defend their theory when creationists already have it figured out? I had to investigate. Joseph Dalton Hooker was a very close friend of Charles Darwin, having offered critique and encouragement as Darwin developed his model descent with modification. Hooker himself is also known as a pioneer in what came to be known as geographical botany or phytogeography. Much like Darwin, Hooker also took on several voyages to various locations around the world to gather paleontological evidence. In 1849, ten years before his friend published Origin of Species, Hooker discovered fragmented organic remains in the metamorphic rocks of the Sikkim Himalaya of northeastern India. Further examination revealed that the fragmented remains were that of crinoids, a clade that includes starfish and sea urchins. Subsequent discoveries of oceanic biota throughout the Himalayas by several others over the decades showed that Hooker's discovery was not a fluke. There were, in fact, marine fossils at the tops of the tallest mountain range on any continent. When news of these discoveries reached European society, it wasn't long before the biblical account of the worldwide flood was offered as an explanation. The secular explanation came after several more decades as geographical and geological correlations indicated crustal movement. As covered in episode 62, the idea that the continents had all once been joined into a single mass had been in publication since 1587. In 1912, Alfred Wegener offered a predictive model of this concept in his German presentation translated as The Uprising of Large Features of Earth's Crust on Geophysical Basis. Wegener demonstrated how geological features of each continent show a continuity when aligned accordingly. This arrangement also happened to correlate to the continuity of fossil finds in this same arrangement. One way or another, the Continental shelves aligned very well, as did their topography and paleontology. Nestled in one portion of the proposed Pangaea, known as Gondwana land, was the landmass that would eventually contain India. In the model, about 100 million years ago, it broke off from Gondwana land and eventually collided with Asia 35 to 55 million years ago. If this were true, then it would explain both the formation of the Himalayas as the result of a continental collision, as well as the presence of marine fossils being found in the thrusted remains of the formerly submerged continental shelves of both India and Asia. This may seem intuitively far-fetched, but this scenario actually makes verifiable predictions. Based on the current northward movement of India into Asia, we can deduce that it would have collided somewhere between 35 and 55 million years ago, so all of the marine fossils discovered in the Himalayas should be no younger than the time of this proposed collision, while the submerged sediments of India should show deposition of more recent oceanic sediments and biota. To date, that is exactly what we find. In fact, the ocean around India had once been an open area known variously as the Tethys Ocean and the Tethys Sea, which also happens to be where the ancestors of whales appeared. This would make the Himalayas and surrounding area the best locale to look for transitional whales. In the past decades, prominent whale ancestors such as Ambulocetus and Pachycetus have been found throughout the Himalayan range. The most compelling prediction of this continental migration, however, came from the petroleum industry. When geologists look for oil, they look for what we call traps, which are non-porous or minimally porous material trapping oil, gas, and water in permeable materials. However they form, this is what we find in the earth. These traps take many forms. The broadest divisions of these forms are structural traps and stratigraphic traps. Stratigraphic traps occur after seismic shifts cause a reservoir to form. Structural traps are simply accumulated petroleum and gas under an impermeable material of some sort. 
In the uniformitarian model, structural traps typically occur when an ocean basin eventually dries up, leaving behind depositions of sediment and biological material that is eventually covered in heavier sediments. Over time, the biological material is heated and compressed, becoming petroleum. Being that petroleum and gas are far lighter than the sediments entrapping them, they slowly migrate upwards until they encounter an impermeable material which then traps the petroleum. One particular type of structural trap is known as a salt dome, which is essentially a giant tower of salt protruding upward through rock and usually accompanied by deposits of oil, gas, and water. There are at least two creationist models on how they form, one by Walt Brown in his hydroplate model and the magmatic sedimentary interfingering model by Steph Hirema, both of which offer an explanation for salt domes, but neither model has offered any testable predictions on where or how to find salt domes. In the uniformitarian model, buried or subducted salt water and sediments exposed to the higher pressures and temperatures below are far more rigid than the rock around it with a lightness that allows it to migrate upward. As the lighter salt dome migrates through various materials, it warps them, leaving a greater and greater void to be filled by migrating oil, gas, and water. This is why we often find hydrocarbon deposits in salt domes at the leading faces of continental shelves. Historically, oil deposits were discovered by accident, usually when a seep would reach the surface or while in the process of digging a well for water. Understanding of oil traps and their formation allowed the petroleum and gas industry to completely overtake the need for whale oil, which was particularly expensive and dangerous to acquire. India's first oil mine, the Digboy Mine, was discovered via an oil seep in 1867. In the decades afterward, numerous other seeps were discovered, but no sizable enough deposits to facilitate a major petroleum industry. Based on Wegener's work, Swiss geologist Emil Argand reasoned that if the Himalayas were the result of two continents colliding, then beneath them we should find salt domes and hydrocarbon deposits. This prediction, given in a 1922 conference in Brussels, followed a decade of predictions of this same phenomenon throughout the world. This is exactly what was discovered in 1971 under the Appalachian Mountains in the U.S., being the site of multiple plate collisions before the Mesozoic. This was also discovered in 1988 under the Pyrenees and Alps, both of which are the result of Spain and Italy colliding with Europe. With the aid of seismic and gravitational measurement, these mountain chains are currently being tapped for their oil resources. Since the 1940s, seismic, magnetic, and gravitational methods of peering into the earth below the Himalayas confirmed Alfred Wegener's model with notable fields being tapped throughout the 80s and 90s. India's oil production has gone from 7,000 barrels per day in the 40s to over 1 million barrels produced daily. While a flood model can certainly accommodate a marine fossil in the Himalayas, that is where its power ends. To date, no geologist has presented a flood-based model which can be useful in predicting where or how to find the phenomena it purports to explain, whether it be a fossil or mineral. Meanwhile, whether or not uniformitarian principles are true, they not only explain how a marine fossil could be found in the Himalayas, they also predict what types of fossils will be found and, more pertinently, where oil, gas, salt, and other minerals will be found before even looking for them. If you drive a car, use electricity, or just like a little seasoning on your food, you are benefiting from these applications every day. They are another example of how creationism taught me real science. In the last video, you might have noticed a few mistakes. When I presented the coordinates Mark Armitage noted in his paper, I strongly implied that they were gibberish. Tom McDonald, Larry Scott, Pun Cheeks 2, Howard F., and others informed me that the coordinates were a quite valid legal description of the place, a 20-acre plot in Dawson County, Montana, near Glendive. Thanks, you guys. Mark Armitage himself also commented with some of his own critique. I stated that Liberty University was unaccredited. Armitage informed me that it is, in fact, accredited by the Southern Association of Colleges, which had actually been first pointed out to me by Jeffrey Getzfred. More importantly, after a few comments about Armitage withholding the horn from examination, he made it clear that the alleged Triceratops horn is available for independent study. Any practicing scientist can request his materials via their institution at the email listed in the description or on any of his published works. And once again, I thank everyone for their comments and corrections. If there's a creationist argument you think I should investigate, please comment below. It may become the basis for a future episode. In the meantime, subscribe and make sure you don't miss it.